The National Security College is a joint venture between the Commonwealth Government and the ANU. Um, and our main role is to, I feel, help promote a new generation of strategic thinkers in the national security space. In order to do that, we run a series of activities, including academic activity, which includes a uh, graduate studies uh, program and a higher degree by research program. Uh, we run executive and professional development courses, which are tailored specifically uh, for officials from government. We also have a research program, and I'm very pleased to say that we're about to publish our first two occasional papers, which are in the question of collaborative leadership. Uh, and lastly, we have a very active outreach program, which this is a part. Australia has a very long history of involvement in non-proliferation, which includes strong roles in the Canberra Commission, the International Commission on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, and also as part of the Nuclear Suppliers Group. Our national commitment to non-proliferation is well illustrated by the long history of disarmament and peace studies here at ANU, which is being continued now through the new ANU Centre on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, which is under the guidance of one of our speakers tonight, Professor, Professor Thakur. And further, matters related to non-proliferation are frequently raised in the media. Only this week we've seen uh, a, a reignition of the controversy of selling uranium to India and a lot of uh, discussion about Japan's nuclear future. I suppose without playing out too much of a metaphor, this is an extremely hot topic. Now tonight we've invited two very prominent experts in non-proliferation to join us to examine these issues tonight. The first is my old friend and colleague, Dr. Rob Floyd. Rob is the Director General of the Australian Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Office. Now, you might not be 100% sure about what uh, ANSO does, so let me introduce it first. Its principal focus is on the international and domestic action against proliferation of nuclear and chemical weapons. And in particular, ANSO works, uh, sorry, ASNO works to strengthen the operation and effectiveness of relevant treaty mechanisms in the technical areas, and particularly in terms of treaty ver verification and compliance. Rob himself is a senior career official and was most recently the Assistant Secretary of Emergency Management and Proliferation Issues in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Rob has been a leader of the CSIRO's Secure Australia program and was a research scientist for nearly 20 years. He holds a Doctor of Philosophy um, from Griffith University and a Bachelor of Science with Honours from the University of New England. Rob, it's great to have you here tonight and I thank you for coming. Joining him tonight is Professor Ramesh Thakur. Ramesh is Professor of International Relations in the Asia-Pacific Centre College of Diplomacy here at the ANU, and he's also an adjunct professor uh, in the Institute of Ethics, Governance and Law at Griffith University. Ramesh has held a number of very senior academic and service appointments in his distinguished career. He was Senior Vice Rector of the United Nations University and concurrently uh, an Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, and has held professorial positions at the University of Wellington in Canada, Otago University in New Zealand and here at the Australian National University. Ramesh was a commissioner and one of the principal authors of the Responsibility to Re Protect report from 2001 and a senior advisor on reforms and principal writer of the United Nations Secretary General's second reform report of 2002. Ramesh is also the author of about 30 books uh, and 300 uh, scholarly uh, uh, articles and book chapters. He also writes regularly for the Quality News here in Australia and around the world. So for tonight's seminar, I'll firstly invite Ramesh to speak on the historical underpinnings of Australia's involvement in non-proliferation and recent international efforts to manage the non-proliferation agenda. I'll then invite Rob to speak on Australian policy perspectives uh, with regard to non-proliferation and to outline some of the measures being taken by the Australian Government in this regard. And to help make time for questions, of which I'm hoping there'll be plenty, Rob and uh, Ramesh, I'll give you a, a quick signal at 15 minutes and, uh, and we'll hopefully finish up by the 20 minutes uh, so then we can do an extensive Q&A uh, session. When we do Q&A, uh, we'll pass a microphone around so that the question can be recorded for the video uh, uh, recording that we're doing of this particular activity. So it does give me great pleasure to introduce Professor Ramesh Thakur to address us first. Thanks, David. Uh, Rob and I were just discussing before we started. Uh, he just came back yesterday from London from a work meeting in this field. I came back yesterday from Washington where I had a discussions on nuclear security summit issues. 
So between us, we might be okay in the Australian time from the directions we've, we've come. Uh, I will talk for no more than 20 minutes. Uh, I'd like to go through the, if you like, the state of play on this issue around the world at the moment. Uh, and time permitting, I'd also like to speak briefly for about five minutes on what we are going to do in this new center that I've just started. Uh, but that will depend on time. Yeah. The basic position is that we seem to find ourselves once again at a familiar crossroads, confronting the same choice between security based on nuclear deterrence or nuclear disarmament. That is, security in and through or from and against nuclear weapons. The tyranny of nuclear complacency could yet exact a fearful price if we sleepwalk our way into a nuclear catastrophe. And part of the reason for establishing this new Center for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, CNND, has been to try and find a way out of this dilemma. Since the end of the Cold War, we're in a bit of a paradoxical position in that the probability of a nuclear war between the major powers, and principally the United States and Russia, has diminished. But the prospect of nuclear weapons actually being used deliberately, by accident or by miscalculation, has become more rather than less plausible. Serious threats persist from the use or misuse of weapons by existing nuclear armed states, particularly in South Asia. Uh, and may I remind you how close we came to a full-fledged war between India and Pakistan in 2002, following the terrorist attacks on India's parliament uh, in December 2001, shortly after 9-11. Threats persist from newly nuclear armed states, particularly in the Middle East, and of course from terrorist actors. And we also have worries about the misuse of the nuclear fuel cycle, the civil nuclear fuel cycle. And therefore major further strengthening of the non-proliferation regimes and major further progress on disarmament remain critically necessary. I don't think an indefinite maintenance of the status quo is a realistic option. In retrospect, I would argue that 1996 was probably the zenith of progress on arms control and disarmament. The NPT was indefinitely and permanently extend, extended in 1995. The World Court affirmed the NPT's disarmament obligations in July 96. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was approved by the UN General Assembly in September, uh, thanks in no small measure, of course, to Australia. But unfortunately, all this proved a false dawn, as over the next decade, we saw but a few faint glimmers of hope amidst a blinding glare of disappointments. <coughs> the nuclear breakout by non-NPT parties India and Pakistan was followed by North Korea's withdrawal from the NPT and its tests. There was little interest to reach the disarmament benchmarks of the 2000 NPT Review Conference. The 2005 NPT Review Conference was a total failure and scandalously, the UN's summit outcome document of October 2005 failed to include even one sentence on the nuclear challenge. Not because they were unaware of the gravity and urgency of the threat, but because they could not agree on even one anodyne sentence on how to include that challenge in the outcome document. But then the nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament agenda was re-energized with a coalition of four U.S. policy heavyweights from the U.S. national security community. Bill Cohen, Henry Kissinger, 
Sam Nunn, Bill Perry, who were influenced not coincidentally by 9-11, the dangers of terrorists getting weapons, and how that affected the relative equation between the assurances <coughs> of possession nuclear weapons and the risks of nuclear weapons in today's world. And they began to advocate for a nuclear weapon-free world. Then we had Barack Obama as candidate, <coughs> affirming his support for such a goal eventually, and reaffirming it as president, most famously in Prague in April 2009, and then presiding over a Security Council deliberation that produced Resolution 1887, reaffirming the NPT obligations and aspirations. That may seem like going back and not much progress, but there was an interesting shift that occurred in US foreign policy. In the discussions leading up to the 1968 signing of the NPT and the negotiations leading up to that, so in the internal American discussions, they had a long debate at the time as to whether they should identify the problem as being these weapons in the wrong hands or these weapons per se. And for a number of reasons, they decided it would not be possible to achieve much progress if they tried, if they tried to make distinctions between good guys and bad guys having the weapons. And so they went in for no one else should have them because the weapons themselves are bad. Alongside, if you like, an attempt by <coughs> those who had them already to keep it for themselves, but stop anyone else from having them. This conclusion was effectively reversed by the Bush administration. Although several administrations had de facto made that distinction already, between Israel and anyone else in the Middle East. The Bush administration, of course, made that distinction, most famously between India and everyone else as well. And certain uh, events followed from that. So in a sense, Barack Obama comes back and goes back to the old consensus. Nuclear weapons are a problem. Furthermore, they are a problem even in the hands of those who have them. So we will, in fact, aim for nuclear. The Washington Nuclear Summit looked closely at the safety and security requirements of nuclear programs and materials. Last year's NPT review conference, you'd get a, a debate amongst the disarmament community who object to calling it a success, but they will agree that it was not a failure, whereas 2005 was a failure. So let's call it a modest success. The International Commission on Nuclear Non Proliferation and Disarmament, co chaired by Kawaguchi from Japan and Gareth Evans from here, and campaigns like Global Zero helped to mobilize key constituencies. A New START treaty was negotiated, signed, ratified, and is in effect. And one of the prices that the Obama administration paid for that, incidentally, I believe, uh, was the extension of the Bush tax cuts. That was a quid pro quo in terms of cross-issue linkages on issues that are not actually linked. <coughs> For all of this, progress over the last three to five years, there is now a palpable and growing sense that the nuclear disarmament balloon has burst. There's little evidence of significant domestic political constituencies in the nuclear armed states to get the train of disarmament back on track. Instead, they all show continued reliance on nuclear weapons and deterrence. Efforts already underway and or plans to modernize and upgrade new nuclear weapons, upgrade nuclear weapons, deployments, and doctrines by the five nuclear weapon states are evidence of their determination to avoid abolition. 
just so you are clear, when I use the phrase nuclear weapon states, I'm referring to the five nuclear powers as per the NPT, United States, Russia, Britain, France, and China. When I use nuclear armed states, I'm including these five, plus all the others who actually have nuclear weapons. So one of the problems in the NPT is its definition of what makes a nuclear weapon state is ideological rather than empirical. It's true by definition. Any country that had nuclear weapons and had tested before 1st January 1967. So France and Britain could technically get rid of the nuclear weapons, but they would still count as nuclear weapon states. India and Pakistan could fight a nuclear war, but they would not count as nuclear weapon states. Mm -hmm. So nuclear armed versus nuclear weapon states. That's just a useful distinction for that reason. So the five nuclear weapon states all show evidence of modernizing or being ready, preparing to modernize their arsenals. India and Pakistan continue to expand and modernize their nuclear arsenals. The fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world today is Pakistan's. When you add to the fact, and when you add that to the fact that Pakistan has more terrorists per square mile than in the whole world, <coughs> you begin to get a sense of unease and anxiety. Uh, just to add to that, before you relax too much, Pakistan is the only one of the eight nuclear armed states where the nuclear program has from the start been under military control. And the military will decide if and when and where and against whom to use, not the civilian government. That's not true of any other nuclear armed states. Pakistan is the only one that is an irredentist nuclear state with claims on territory, significant chunk of territory. It is the only one that actively promotes insurgency, insurgency as uh, state policy. It is the only one that has active uh, terrorist assets as a matter of state policy. So it's not a very reassuring uh, situation. It is difficult to believe that any Indian government would be able to exercise restraint again if faced with another Mumbai-style attacks, simply in terms of the domestic politics. So, as I said, there, there are lots of reasons to be fearful of, of where we might end up with that. Israel is not upgrading and modernizing, but it is marking time, waiting to see how, if at all, the world will deal with Iran. Iran's nuclear ambitions have failed to be checked by all efforts to date by the international community. But we're still trying to do our best to keep Iran inside the box. I'm not sure that we can figure out how to get North Korea back inside the box. The CTBT is no nearer entering into force. Fissile Materials Treaty, no nearer negotiations. Conflicts and disarmament for a decade has not been able to agree on an agenda. There is also a revival of interest in nuclear power, which may suffer temporary blip or setback post Fukushima, but I don't think it's going to be a major reversal, uh, particularly in Asia uh, and other parts of the world. And that in turn throws up a number of issues. How do we ensure? that nuclear plants are operated with complete safety so that chances of accidents are minimized and mechanisms and procedures are put in place so that accidents are discovered immediately, the effects are mitigated and firewalls are constructed to prevent wider damage. How do we secure the plants against theft and leakage of weapons, sensitive material, skills and knowledge? How do we build firewalls between civilian and weapons-related use of nuclear power? How do we establish multinational regimes for the assurance of fuel supply, the management of spent fuel, the disposal of radioactive wastes, and the decommissioning of old reactors? And these concerns relate not just to the countries in which the reactors are located, but also to the international trade in nuclear material, skills, and equipment. And there's a lovely quote from the previous Director General of the IAEA, Mohammed al Ghurada, who said, and I quote, nuclear components designed in one country 
could be manufactured in another, shipped through a third, assembled in a fourth, and used in a fifth. So that's your trade, uh, international trade in nuclear weapons. As of the start of this year, there were 20,000 nuclear weapons in the world's inventories, plus, 20,000 plus. 5,000 5, of these launch ready, 2,000 indeed in a state of high operational alert. After the New START Treaty, the Americans will go down to, when it's fully implemented, 1,550 deployed strategic warheads. In terms of their triad, that will still include 420 deployed intercontinental ballistic missiles, 240 <coughs> submarine launched ballistic missiles, 60 heavy bombs. But in addition, the United States' US plans include retaining a hedge of reserve warheads for potential rapid upload, and the construction of three new nuclear bomb factories for increased warhead production capacity. In other words, essentially, the Cold War nuclear force structure has been retained rather than abandoned. Faced with this, there's one other item I'll just mention because I actually saw it today. This is an article in Yale Global Online, published deadline yesterday, but New York Times yesterday, of course, is today for us. So you just got it today because it gives you a sense of where we might be heading in, even in the future. We know the problem countries, but there's a whole range of other countries, in a sense, circling who might become interested in going down this path also, or might develop postures and policies and inventories that suggest a degree of ambivalence. And one of these that has come on the list to watch out for in the future, surprisingly, is South Korea. And this is an article by someone called Lee Byung Chul, who served on the foreign and national security policy planning staff of two South Korean presidents. He points out that there are right-wing elements now clamoring for a reversal of the denuclearization of the peninsula, a reintroduction of American nuclear weapons onto the peninsula, and even perhaps contemplating a future in which South Korea itself might want to go down that path as the United States keeps experiencing relative decline and the strength of its assurances to Asian allies might be less credible. So, what can we do in Australia? Well, Rob will talk very shortly, and I won't be much long at all, on <coughs> what governments do. There are some things, of course, only governments can do. There are other things that governments can do better than anyone else. But then there are some things that governments, being governments, <coughs> find politically much more complicated and sensitive to do, <coughs> where it is useful to have institutions outside government circles who can raise issues of concern, suggest possible ways forward, identify options and alternatives. And it is in that sense that we have been set up with a view to going back over the past few or five years, looking at the whole plethora of agreements, authoritative speeches by relevant officials and leaders, outcome documents, etc., and distilling from these policy benchmarks and converting these into a forward looking agenda under five categories, nuclear disarmament, nuclear non-proliferation, security dimensions of civil nuclear energy, nuclear terrorism, and building blocks for non-proliferation and disarmament. And under these five
five headings, picking out these policy benchmarks and a forward-looking agenda. And then in partnership, particularly with the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute and the Geneva Center for Security Policy, but taking advantage of the wealth of research and very high quality research being done all over the world. Collate, collecting and collating the material and as I said, distilling them into policy action agendas under these five headings. And then seeing how many of these agreements, declarations, outcome documents, benchmarks are being met or are likely to be met by the time of the next NPT Preparatory Commission meetings and the next NPT Review Conference in 2015. How many are falling short but are essentially still in the right direction and on track? And how many are going to fall well short, let alone how many and which ones have been set aside completely? So it's an issue by issue, category by category evaluation of where we stand with the hope of making it less sensitive by not going in for a country by country finger pointing exercise. And then recognizing that at the end of the day, we may be an advocacy organization, but we are not governmental or intergovernmental. And it's only the intergovernmental machinery and governments that can actually do something about it. So present this in the form of a succinct research and evidence-based report to the PREPCOM process and hope that they can take it in uh, to the review conference. That, in short, is the goal of my center. Uh, I'll hand it over to Rob to take you through where the Australian government stands on the whole range of different regimes and treaties and conventions. Thank you very much. a very sobering assessment, um, but uh, an assessment I think that is very important for us all to hear. Firstly, I'd like to start by thanking the National Security College and particularly Professor Lestrange for uh, holding this event and focusing on this issue. I agree wholeheartedly with Professor Thacker that it is more than the role of governments to see the issues of non-proliferation and disarmament move forward. It is probably inadequate for governments to try and do this alone. And it is important that groups that take an advocacy role outside of governments are empowered and are speaking. It's important that they are empowered by public opinion. Clearly, there is a debate that goes on across the community around issues nuclear. And long may that continue because that debate is the essence which empowers his centre and provides guidance to governments for us to be able to move forward. Just in opening, I would observe that the issue of non-proliferation and disarmament is not a short game. It's a long game. And I want to make a few comments about what does success look like. Because maybe success, if it's about complete elimination, would only lead to uh, pessimism and depression and a sense of failure. While I see some of the officials in the room here smiling, that is not necessarily the measure that we should use. But let me explain that further as we move forward. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad this event is on. Uh, this is uh, important stuff for the public to be involved with. I'm going to uh, flick through a number of these topics, but I'm also going to jump a whole bunch of my slides and focus on some of the key issues that I see about the Australian government's commitment and involvement in uh, the weapons of mass destruction space and some of our particular policy interests. It's so interesting that this issue, particularly around nuclear weapons, brings together two of the great threats to society as we know it these days. It brings together the threat of climate change and the threat of weapons of mass destruction. Two issues that could substantially, radically or disastrously change the way that life is for us. 
And it's so interesting to see how some aspects of this are in complete contradiction as to what you might wish to do for you know, reducing proliferation may be completely at odds with what you might want to do to reduce carbon emissions, such as the difficulty of some of the policy that has to be wrestled with around these issues. My comments will be largely on nuclear uh, non-proliferation and disarmament, but I will touch on chemical and biological uh, towards the end. A couple of the policy interests of the Government of Australia, but many other governments too, are these. There's a whole range of different areas, be it about our protecting our national security, ensuring our economic prosperity, or issues now brought in together with this about energy security and uh, you know, environmental uh, you know, concerns about uh, climate change. In the national security area, it is far from straightforward as to what a nation such as Australia should do. We are strongly of the belief that we should move towards a world without nuclear weapons. However, we have our security pinned in part to the nuclear umbrella of the United States of America. But we hold both these at the same time. This is the difficulty of this space. And we then find ourselves having to consider for as long as there are nuclear weapons, we hold a certain position. Although in the long game, as I said before, we may aspire to a world which was without nuclear weapons, that is a different set of circumstances. So there is a need to hold some of these tensions, and tensions they are. Uh, my last dot point under national security, referring to good relations with ma major powers, you know, our security, you know, Australia is, is very, very good at building alliances, at building relationships and assuring our security and our trading arrangements, etc., on strong relationship building. But then we can find some times that those relationship building uh, objectives may be in conflict with non-proliferation or disarmament objectives. And we've got to work through that. And one of those tensions that the government may one day seek to wrestle with is, is that to do with India. And should we export uranium to India? You know, it is a difficult policy debate if and when it is had. And that is to say that our policy currently is that we do not export uranium to any nation state that is not a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. India is not. Therefore, we can't export to India. But India is now saying to us that our strategic relationship would be so much enhanced by us exporting uranium to them and thus there is a tension. Now, if the government was to consider changing its policy, it's in that conundrum that it might look at that policy. But it remains a point of tension. Uranium exports, a lot could be said about the economic prosperity and value to Australia around exporting uranium, one of the largest holders of uranium reserves in the world. I would encourage you to keep it in perspective that if you look at Australia's earnings from the export of different minerals, uranium is not top, it's not second top. In fact, it's at least two orders of magnitude lower than the top in the amount that we export, or the, sorry, the value of that export. Coal is way up here. Hello, another energy source. Coal is way up here. Iron ore is a little below it. And uranium is somewhere way down here. So we need to be careful that we don't over-argue issues around economic prosperity and the need to export uranium. Energy security, I've touched on those issues and uh, you know, a dilemma that, uh, that countries face is to do you embrace nuclear power? If you do, does that contribute towards proliferation or not? I say it need not. But that is not saying that I'm an advocate for nuclear power. My office, just so, so that you've got the context, the, the um, Australian Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Office is responsible for safeguarding 
which means to ensure that Australian material technology, etc., does not get into weapons programs, so safeguarding against things getting into weapons programs, and responsible for nuclear security, making sure that it stays controlled where it should. When I look at the safeguarding side and the security side, I'm sure we can manage nuclear material in a way which will be adequately safeguarded and secure. The debate about nuclear power or not is on a different axis, not on the axis of safeguarding or security. Australia has a proud history in the non-proliferation space, not just an ordinary history, but a proud history, and the Chancellor of this university has been one of many who have contributed to that proud history. And I've listed a number of the achievements here that, you know, that Australia points to and continues to perform uh, well on, is that we're a founder of the International Atomic Energy Agency, that kind of watchdog and uh, a nuclear body under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation mm. Treaty, and we have a semi-permanent seat on the Board of Governors of that body. We set up a new export control regime called the Australia Group uh, around chemical and biological uh, weapons and precursors to, to the making of those weapons. We were involved in initiating the introduction of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty into the UN General Assembly because it was stalled in the uh, aforementioned body that uh, Professor Thacker mentioned, the Conference on Disarmament. And then that has uh, moved forward to a point where uh, countries are are um, signing up and ratifying such an agreement. We've played a leading role in the strengthening of safeguards arrangements following uh, concerns about breakouts in Iraq and undetected activities, and we were the first to incorporate an additional protocol to our agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency around safeguards. We've been involved in a crucial way in bringing the Chemical Weapons Convention into play. and as a, a, the Australian government stands to support all of the non-proliferation regimes and that's a major part of our policy framework. So these are the achievements of a government that have over many years and of different persuasions of government been very committed to these issues. I'm not going to talk about the various uh, treaty arrangements and export control and other counter-proliferation <coughs> arrangements, we'll leave that for some other day. A couple of the risks around the nuclear space, and this is where I get back to the issue of what does success look like. When the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was negotiated and agreed, there was an expectation that over time there could be 30 or more countries with nuclear weapons. At the time of signing, there were five. Now, as has been pointed out, if we look at nuclear arms states, there are eight. Is that success or failure? Now, call me an optimist if you would, but I would say it's actually success, that it is limited to only eight, and did not achieve the, the, the feared level of 30 nation states with nuclear weapons. So. Has the Non-Proliferation Treaty been successful? I, I say it had, continues to be successful. Is it a difficult marriage between the haves, who are committed to disarmament, and the have-nots, who are committed to not having, and at the same time the inalienable right of all to have nuclear energy? Yes, it is a difficult relationship to hold those three pillars of the Non-Proliferation Treaty in balance. But as we continue step by step in working that out, it has held for quite a long period of time, and I think it will hold for quite a long period of time to come. There are a number of states, significant states, outside of the NPT, but there's a certain stability around those sorts of issues. I mentioned the Nuclear Suppliers Group exemption. This is where India, as a, a, a country outside of the NPT, has been given the right uh, for other countries to trade in sensitive technologies and nuclear materials. Some say that's the beginning of the end to the nuclear architecture. I don't think that is necessarily true at all, uh, but it's one of those things that continues to test as we evolve. Will the grand deal hold, the grand deal of disarmament, non-proliferation and nuclear energy? I think it will for the foreseeable future. 
um, some are very concerned that how we deal with Iran and North Korea is really the crucial test of the regime as to how it will move forward. I think it's a, a test. It is one of the current issues, or two of the current issues, that have to be focused on. But I do not think that the Non-Proliferation Treaty you know, survives or sinks on the basis of a couple of states that have broken out. Um, I think there is a lot more commitment across the countries um, than, than that, that it would fall apart. I'm not going to go into particular issues around um, you know, various uh, countries. You can read about those in various other sources. Uh, yes, there are continued problems, but down the bottom, you know, there are some countries, like, such as Libya, that have moved away from nuclear weapons. And that is a positive thing. South Africa has moved away. So there's a number that, that have moved in the right direction, you know, which is, is very good to see. And uh, we've already mentioned about some of those states. In our region, there, there is continuing reporting in the uh, public media around Burma and Burma potentially having interest in uh, having A, a nuclear power uh, capability, or B, a nuclear weapons capability. Um, I think those allegations are being taken seriously by the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, as they continue to uh, build their relationship with the, uh, with the Burmese officials and government and are looking for inspection opportunities within Burma. It's as any mature regime should do if there are claims and they should be then investigated and, and considered as to whether there is substance there and what should be done about it. The expansion of the nuclear energy area, I'll just touch on that briefly. Yes, there has been a significant interest of many countries in recent times to embrace nuclear energy, not least because of concerns about reducing carbon emissions. And some say, well, that has got huge proliferation risks. Again, I would say that doesn't have to be the case, um, is that there are ways of implementing a nuclear uh, power capability which doesn't necessarily build proliferation risk. One of those, which is of particular interest, is in the United Arab Emirates, where in the United Arab Emirates they have chosen to forswear any enrichment and reprocessing capabilities. But they're going to set up a nuclear power uh, capability, so they won't even have those sensitive technologies on their soil. And they will then be returning you know, spent fuel afterwards so that it goes back to a country that has produced it in the first place. So they don't have the technology, they don't have the material, and so in a sensitive part of the world, there is a model which has a minimum of proliferation potential. There are encouraging signs around that as well as some of the international multilateral um, you know, fuel supply options, you know, fuel banks being established in different places. I shall uh, move on. The disarmament issue, uh, I think uh, Ramesh has covered that one adequately, so I won't uh, pursue it further here today. Nuclear terrorism, <coughs> the Australian government it certainly has been committed to the Nuclear Security Summit initiative of President Obama. Just two weeks ago, I was at a Sherpas meeting, uh, the, the leaders, the, I mean, the people who lead the leaders to the summit, the Sherpas meeting for the next Nuclear Security Summit, which will be held at the end of March next year, uh, to take stock of how nations are going towards securing you know, all vulnerable nuclear material. Uh, it is a good initiative of 47 nations, not all nations, but of 47 nations, and is moving in a helpful direction you know, to secure nuclear materials. Chemical weapons, some say a poor man's nuclear weapons. Um, yes, that, that might, be, might be so, and maybe it is more accessible, as with biological uh, weapons as well, than nuclear. Um, that is true, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, Australia is strongly involved with Chemical Weapons Convention and the Office for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague in um, the work there towards the destruction of all chemical weapons stockpiles that currently exist and uh, again towards uh, no proliferation in chemical <coughs> weapons activities. Um, biological weapons, just very quickly, biological weapons and the potential thereof has to be dealt with differently to nuclear. And the reason is that the technology and the materials to be able to make such a weapon 
is so much more easily available. The technology is generally born open. What I mean by that is much of the nuclear technology is born classified and is managed from there. You can't do that with biotechnology because it is so fundamental to human health and agriculture advancement and it is so well developed outside of the military domain that your measures of control and, and verification of control are very difficult. So it needs a different approach. Um, it will never have the, the tough, rigorous approach that we have around nuclear. But there is a, you know, an ongoing discussion around the Biological Weapons Convention and the, the Conference of State Parties, which continues to advance uh, this issue. So just finishing on some of the recent actions of Australia. Yes, we are in compliance with all of the non-proliferation regimes. That's the very minimum that you would expect of a government such as Australia. The, we take a very active role in the development of various of the international norms and, and certainly those to do with nuclear security uh, and we're involved in outreach into the region of the Asia Pacific area uh, in a number of different forums. Uh, we chair the Asia Pacific Safeguards Network, it's a, a, a network for the professionalisation of safeguards organisations in different countries across the region. We continue to be involved in the promotion of verification of the Biological Weapons Convention and hold some optimism for the Fissile Material Cut-Off Treaty by engaging in some of the technical discussions to bring the political discussion into some sort of environment where maybe there can be serious um, you know, negotiations commence. It's still a long haul, but there are steps in the right direction. The establishment of the International Commission on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament and the work plan that Gareth Evans and um, Ms. Kuragachi from uh, Japan conducted a couple of years ago was an outstanding contribution towards, I think, the success of the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in 2010. Um, Gareth Evans is a man of great energy, great intellect, and the success of the ICNND would not have been what it was without those characteristics. You know, he is quite phenomenal to see in action on these issues and uh, you know, I'm proud to call him an Australian and for what he's done in that area. And finally, following on from the 2010 uh, Nuclear uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty um, Review Conference, there's this formation of what we call NPDI. It's a cross-regional group on non-proliferation and disarmament initiative it is co-chaired again by Australia and Japan with an interesting collection of countries. Now these are non-nuclear uh, weapon state countries and these countries are working together to seek to see the agreements that came out of the 2010 Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference implemented um, and they are doing some significant work to that regard in this five year uh, period between NPT review conferences. That gives you something of an overview of some of the activities of the Australian Government, some of the values of the Australian Government, but most of all some of the, the difficult policy issues that surround non-proliferation and disarmament. I thank you for your interest and uh, look forward to the questions. that uh, your Chancellor has many interests and uh, is active in a number of areas and still active in this one uh, for our plan. I think that uh, those two presentations have really thrown up a large number of issues for us to consider and I would like to be able to take now the good part, best part of the next 25 minutes uh, to do so. In order to show us if you'd like to uh, ask a question, just raise your hand. Please wait till Ash brings the microphone to you so that we can make sure it's recorded properly and we'll uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'm the Swedish ambassador, and I'm not talking for my government. Um, thank you very much for very interesting introductions. I recently read about what's happening in, in CD Geneva, and my impression was that the enthusiasts and optimists like Sweden and Australia and a few other countries mainly decided to give it another year before they throw in the towel. 
that's how bad the situation is in Syria. And I'm wondering whether it isn't time to somehow completely think anew. Because what we have been doing so far is to continue on the agenda created by basically Europe and US, and I include Australia and Europe. Meaning that now we have a new multipolar world where the US and Europe cannot any longer set the agenda. There are so many other countries who are involved in setting the agenda. And isn't it somehow necessary to make these countries participate more active instead of us, the old enthusiasts, pushing, pushing this agenda? How this could be done, I have no idea. But I wonder, especially after you, Professor, talking about uh, what's happening in Pakistan and the situation between Pakistan and India, if one aspect that should be discussed more is how do we limit a nuclear war? This sounds awful, but with the situation as you describe it, this might be what we will have to deal with. And the positive aspect about that might be that if we put that on the agenda, maybe we will have a popular opinion again when it comes to the spread of nuclear weapons and the threat of using nuclear weapons. Because right now there is no popular opinion at all, almost. And that's one of the problems for democratic governments. How do you push on this issue when there is no strong popular feeling behind? And, and also, since, since it's, it seems to, to be so, so likely that this will develop, maybe that is what should be on our agenda instead of just continuing to work on these very small, partly idealistic issues where we simply cannot move one yoga at MCT, for example. And then the big question is, of course, what should the Western world do? What should the Australian government do? Well, my very frank and brutal answer to that is start thinking about the missile defense. Thank you. Well, let's make a start with Ramesh for a few minutes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I'm pleased that you still retain a one year window of opportunity, optimism with regard to the conference and disarmament. I gave up on that while I was still a UN official. <laughs> I think the significant progress we have achieved on a range of arms control and disarmament initiatives, uh, both conventional weapons and WMD, have essentially all come from outside the, the CD4. You know, when was the last initiative that came through there? I, I can't even remember. Uh, and of course, the, the Ottawa process on landmines issue was very much a reflection of frustrations with that. Uh, at one point, I said that CD stands for cumbersome and deadlocked. <laughs> uh, that remains true. But at the same time, you're quite right. It does not mean that there are not other avenues and mechanisms and actors for pursuing some important initiatives and objectives. Uh, and the agenda has been sketched out, including by the RCNND. Uh, I, I've been working with Gareth Evans for uh, almost two decades now. I have been fortunate, unlike many officials in foreign ministry here, in never having had to work for Gareth Evans. <laughs> I'm told there is a distinction in practice between the two. Uh, one day I might discover that. But uh, I've I worked alongside him uh, for a number of issues. But if you read the, that report, it sets out a very nice set of uh, agenda items. There are many things we can do. We can continue to insist on reducing numbers. Let's face it, more than 90% of the nuclear weapons stockpile is still held by Russia and the United States. Whereas 95% of the press attention is focused on Iran and North Korea. But if nuclear weapons themselves are, yeah. but No, but we need to keep reducing the numbers. Uh, and you have some analyses suggesting that the United States could achieve all its nuclear security goals with a number, I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it's around 341 nuclear weapons instead of the 8,000 odd it has today. Because, of course, these weapons are not, you know, they're not target specific. They can be reconfigured and redeployed and stuff like that. But leave that aside. We can reduce the numbers. We can keep
keep demanding that other countries join in this. But so far, the bulk of that has been Russia and the United States. But there's no reason why uh, other countries in the nuclear armed category could not come in. We can minimize role, visibility. We can separate delivery systems from overheads. We can lend in the decision-making fuse for these. Uh, we can delegitimize deployments and doctrine and, and encourage adherence to nuclear weapon free zones. Uh, if you think of the nuclear security summit that, that, that Rob is engaged in, uh, because most of the significant actors in this field tend to be from the northern hemisphere, they forget the southern hemisphere is virtually covered in nuclear free mm -hmm. zones, many of which regional arrangements have already built in secretariats and uh, in my discussion in Washington, I raised this, and people haven't thought of it, but you could actually have some of these inspection and verification and implementation mechanisms taken through these existing arrangements also. So they are there. And of course, the initiative that Rob talked about, that is Australia, Japan, includes other countries. So it's already going beyond that. I don't, I think that universal intergovernmental machinery is useful for validating and ratifying. But most of the discussions and negotiations and substantive progress will come outside that scheme, not in it. And that represents, I think, a good partnership and a model for how we can approach these uh, and, and increase the normative and treaty-based constraints and practical measures to delay the decision to use them. Because one thing about nuclear weapons, the consequences are not limited just to the countries concerned. And to the extent that we suffer from that, we have a right to make representations. And Rob, come Very quickly, in the interest of more questions, um, the conference of disarmament given one more year uh, before it is killed or something to that effect. Um, Mercy killing. That, that's, that's very strong, Ambassador. Um, the way we see it is that the, the five nuclear weapon states are looking increasingly more seriously at the leadership they need to provide to the commencement of any uh, negotiations of fissile material cutoff treaty. And I think that's a significant and important step because uh, it, without their leadership, there is no fissile material cutoff treaty. So maybe with that leadership, that then influences, after a year of that leadership, the uh, Conference on Disarmament. There, your comment that we don't live in a, bowl pi a bipolar world, um, we see that very strongly, and the NPDI, as uh, Ramesh mentioned, uh, has got intentionally cross-regional representation on it so that we see a more of a global um, you know, activity, the Nuclear Security Summit, 47 countries scattered all around, another expression of the same. Um, do we see new leadership rising up? I'm really encouraged with some of the diplomatic leadership coming out of Indonesia in our region, and their commitment and interest to some of these issues is, is very, very hard. I'm the devil's advocate. Uh. Um, Does the devil's advocate have a name? <laughs> she might. Later on. Um, we talk about disarmament like it's a strategy or an end in itself. I'm just wondering, what do you think are the implications of global nuclear disarmament? What kind of world does that leave us with? It's a very good question. Uh, I think one of the it, it picks up on a recurring threat in, in Rob's presentation, and that is that countries have genuine and legitimate security concerns and apprehensions. Their security policies reflect this, and it is these fears that are embedded in a range of practices, relationships, weapons, etc. Simply to demand nuclear abolition doesn't take care of all these fears and concerns. If we are going to move to nuclear disarmament on the argument that the risks that are inherent in these are of a magnitude that they exceed potential benefits, 
nonetheless it is incumbent on us to identify how the security concerns can be met by alternative strategies and policies and remedies. If we fail to do that, we are not going to get to nuclear abolition, and we don't deserve to. And that's why I was talking of, or we talk about short-term, medium-term, and long-term strategies. But to get that equation going, we also need to begin the long-term process thinking about that now, rather than just defer it, so that it is not seen as a rhetorical alibi for doing nothing. Some say that a nuclear weapon-free world could be a less stable and a less secure place than one with nuclear weapons. There is a certain you know, uh, stability to an armed world. I remain very confident that if we move towards a nuclear weapon free world, that with the caution that is being exercised by those armed states, sorry, those weapon states, um, in embracing such ideas that there will be no void left um, as we move towards such a thing. Uh, the bigger concern would be that that caution would be sufficiently great that we'd never move towards it rather than creating a void of insecurity. Well, I have a question. Um, China hasn't been mentioned much, although Rob, you did mention in passing. And Ramesh, I'm wondering, what, what is China's role in nuclear disarmament? Perhaps what should it be, do you think? <laughs> what is its role? Not very good. It's the country that no one likes to mention. If you relate this to the debate that Rob mentioned about should we export uranium to India? And you listen to the Indian government people and Indian analysts, they make the point that, okay, you said India is a non-signatory to the NPT, China is a signatory, you will export to China, you want to export to us. If you look at the NPT obligations and look at the actual record of behavior, leaving the actual signature aside, there is basis to the Indian claim that actually India's record is far more NPT compliant than is China's. We know China was complicit in some proliferation activities via the Pakistan and North Korea. You look at the NPT command network and where it went and where it is. So there is that history and some of those activities, by the way, if you remember, went on even after 9-11. Uh, and if you look at the statements from Abu Qadir Khan himself about the exchange between Pakistan and North Korea, facilitated by and overflying China, there is that aspect there as well. In response to the civil nuclear deal with the US by India, China has been pressing for an exemption for Pakistan and may decide to engage in various activities there itself. On the other hand, the cause of the world being what it is, and because of the absolute need for China's cooperation on a whole range of issues, it's not something that's going to be helped if, if governments start speaking the way I've been speaking in the past couple of minutes and, and fingering China. So we still need to work with them uh, because it, it, you know, it's not going to get any progress on any of these issues without somehow bringing China in. Uh, it, one legitimate question is whether China would still do this with Pakistan now if it could, have, if it could foresee where it was going to lead. It, it, it's a rare, perhaps not unique, because after all, France has a history with Israel also. Uh, but it, it is a rare example of this. So yes, we need China. I don't think we should be, we should ignore its actual record and history, but that doesn't mean to say that we should bring it up as opposed to maybe saying, look, we need to get out of this mess together. It's just got a bit too dangerous for anyone's comfort. Just while the microphone is uh, moving, just a comment on China. Um, thank you for not pushing it. Um, China is a part of the, the nuclear weapon states and those five countries work together on a whole range of issues and um, you know they all have different perspectives and so there's a 
um, yeah, there's challenges for the P5 to see things in a common way and work together. But I see signs where that's happening more and, and uh, yeah, as things move forward. Um, the second issue that I've mentioned that in terms of disarmament, when you consider the number of um, weapons that the US and Russia hold between them, it's difficult to engage China in a discussion about disarmament when their levels are so much lower. So at some point in the future, I think that is more likely to come on as a discussion. And, and that's a day I look forward to when you know, the, the US-Russian numbers are down such that the other uh, of the nuclear weapon states need to start thinking about their own disarmament as well. Now, I want to take two more questions. So the first one there will be, will be, will be shortened to the point. Hi, my name is Sanjay. I'm a master's student in international relations. Uh, regarding uranium exports to India by Australia, given the importance of Australia's trade relationship with China, how does that dynamic relate to uh, uranium exports to India? Uh, on a simple issue like uh, the Dalai Lama visiting here, China is so fiercely uh, opposed. Will they stand back and just let Australia export uranium to India without any sort of fight back on that? Australia's export of uranium to India would require a significant change in the government's policy. Uh, as I said before, you know, one of the first of those uh, you know, policy criteria is to be a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, also to have in place a comprehensive safeguards agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency and to have agreed an additional protocol. Um, India still need to move towards having an additional protocol in place. Um, so there are several steps and that's our, our normal policy on the export of uranium. Um, it would require the government to change its position significantly before contemplation of trade in uranium to India you know, could occur. I think China's reacting like that is less likely than uh, Pakistan's reaction which would make it even more distant a goal to get an official materials treaty through. So you've got all sorts of considerations in the background to this. Thank you, John Sullivan from the Center for Defense and Strategic Studies. Rob, you talked about eight nuclear armed states, but amongst that eight, you didn't include the DPRK. But given the DPRK has had two nuclear weapon tests, is it your assessment that it's not yet a nuclear armed state in the sense of having nuclear weapons? Um, I don't class it as such necessarily. Um, but uh, <coughs> as you're well aware, John, that there are a range of um, moves towards you know, that capability. You know, exactly what capability uh, DPRK has In terms of our relationship with the DPRK, then it's clear what their intentions are. Um, and we see that the, the future of negotiations with the DPRK rests with the six party talk me mechanism. And uh, um, yeah, we look forward to further meetings of the six party talks. We will take one just last question and then we'll wrap up. Um, Nick Floyd from the Australian Defence College. Uh, Rob, you mentioned before um, the slightly the, the pragmatic benefit, I guess, between the, the tension between the um, uh, energy policy, environmental policy, uh, non-proliferation and, and disarmament policy that, that Australia and other countries similar to it uh, need to sort of, I guess, balance you know, for an effective foreign policy um, portfolio. <coughs> but I guess, uh, and, and obviously the current government's policy is to, uh, to change that, that balance greatly. But is there, is there a, an opportunity to extend that further into consideration of things such as uh, economic uh, policy and productivity, I, I guess, as well, from the national? And to that end, is there a, a plausibility that in the future, I'm trying to ask this question in as simple a way as possible for it, um, for future governments to look at 
not just exporting uh, unprocessed, unrefined uh, nuclear uh, material uh, at the yellow cap sort of uh, level, but actually looking at taking a hint from uh, the UAE and other countries like that that are looking at um, <coughs> out the actual the technology behind nuclear energy and looking towards value adding a, uh, an arrangement where we are contrib contributing in demonstrative terms about non proliferation because we are um, controlling as much of the process as possible in a country as stable and as adherent to the SBT treaties and other, other conventions uh, by doing it in our regard. I think uh, those propositions from time to time yeah, do come up. There's another proposition related to that which I find most interesting, and that is where um, different countries approach us and say, why don't you become the nuclear waste dump of the world? You've got such stable geology, you've got such open spaces, etc., and there's huge money involved in it. My response to people that raise that is that you're talking about a country that is not comfortable to embrace nuclear energy for its own domestic use. It probably is a long bow to say that, that country is willing to embrace nuclear waste. Now you raise a different scenario at the front end, which is to say if we are a miner of uranium, why don't we do conversion and enrichment in Australia and sell a value-added product? And again, it's an economic argument to be brought to bear. My reflection on that would be that I imagine the government would consider that in the same way as looking for their comfort on various issues nuclear. And that probably that is a much bigger step than embracing nuclear energy in Australia. But uh, that's obviously the property of governments to determine and to weigh. Uh, but um, your proposition, you're not the first one who's raised that one of the potential of value add. Uh, I think it's a it's a, a political decision to be thought about and, and, to, and to consider in that, uh, that way. Yeah, uh, just David, you mentioned and, and Rob repeated and I'd like to endorse it as well. I think on this issue, uh, Australia has history has credentials, has credibility. And I certainly hope that we'll stay engaged with that. Uh, one of those reasons is uh, the Canberra Commission, which had a very interesting uh, set of three propositions, which I'll end up with. One, the very destructiveness of nuclear weapons makes them politically unusable against non-nuclear weapon states, because the political costs would far exceed any possible military gains from that. But it also makes them militarily unusable against other nuclear weapon states. Just think about it. The biggest Soviet territorial gains after the Second World War were during the period when the Americans had a monopoly, 1945 to 49. Conversely, the Soviets get their nuclear weapons, attain strategic parity, and then implode. It wasn't very useful either politically or militarily to them. Uh, <coughs> India, Pakistan. It doesn't help either country combat poverty, fight disease, fight insurgency, fight terrorists. Indeed, the worry is added by the element of terrorism there. It doesn't even add to prestige. During a time when both countries have had nuclear weapons, Pakistan's international reputation has gone slowly but steadily downhill. India's has gone upwards. Nuclear weapons have been irrelevant to both. So they don't actually serve any political or military purpose. But saying that doesn't get us there. Nonetheless, it's important to remember that because they remain an ever-present and clear danger to all of us. And on that note, we'll wrap up tonight's <coughs> seminar. I think uh, you'll join me in thanking both speakers for the way they've outlined the, uh, the matters. I think yeah, particularly when we look at what are the aims of proliferation and non-proliferation, what how do you measure success are two really big questions. Also then how do we manage the competing or the inherently competing tensions within our foreign policy um, that proliferation and non-proliferation actually really make for us. And I think both Robert and Ramesh should outline those superbly tonight. Can I ask you to join me in thanking our speakers for, for their for their presentations?